you guys. It's like to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, so yes, today I'm going to be presenting Garbage In, Garbage Out, how seemingly really great machine learning models can be screwed up by bad data. So first, I'm going to talk about a problem in the context of cybersecurity and machine learning. Uh, and next, we're going to go through a uh, train test data set sensitivity analysis, which is going to help us first uh, better detect deployment, um, deployment accuracy, especially when we don't have access to deployment data. Uh, and second, improve that deployment accuracy by picking better training data sets that aren't garbage. So first, I'm going to show three main things um, to sort of give this analysis some context. Uh, model accuracy claimed by machine learning researchers is sort of inherently misleading, at least the classical accuracy. Um, and it's generally biased in an overly optimistic direction. So uh, as a result, estimating the severity of that bias is really important. And it's um, going to make sure that our models that we deploy on the endpoint aren't really bad. So first, uh, at the highest level, right, what is machine learning? Uh, it is just a function. You have input, you have a function, and you have your output. OK, so for us today, we're going to be talking about classifying um, URL strings as benign or malicious. So our input is just a URL string. Our function is some machine learning model, um, in our case, later, a convolutional neural net. And the output is going to be a number from 0 to 1, hopefully indicating whether that URL is malicious or benign, so near 1 or near 0. Right, so this can just be treated as a black box for now. We have input, a function, and output. But how do we get that machine learning model, that black box? Uh, we train our models, right? So we start off with a nice pink data set with a heart on it, and we split it up into two groups. At least this is the, the classical way to do it. Um, we split it up into a larger training uh, data set and a smaller test data set. And the key thing to note at these is that these are separate, right? They're disjoint. Um, and so we take all of our training data, and we hand it over to our machine learning model, our black box. Um, so if you can see that video in the, on the screen, I can't. Um, a neural net is sort of fitting to the data that it's been giving, given. And that gives us a fitted model F, right? So we're giving uh, our model our URLs, the labels that we want um, it to know. And it's sort of giving back this, this model that's going to be able to, to look at a URL and tell us, oh, I think this is benign or malicious. OK, so next up in this process is test accuracy. Uh, here you can see a bunch of dots. And imagine that a machine learning model is trying to predict if a dot should be classified as blue or red uh, based on where it is. So if we look at training accuracy, right, um, the model thinks it's doing really awesome. It's, it's really impressed with itself. It's classified every single point correctly. Uh, and so it, it, thinks, it thinks it's hot stuff. But we want to know how the model is actually going to do on new data. Um, OK, so what happens when we give it new data that it's never seen before? Brr. Bad stuff. There's a lot of misclassifications. Um, and so this is test accuracy. It's supposed to sort of represent how a model is going to do on new data in the real world. So same situation here. Uh, we have a little tiny neural net figuring out this spiral-shaped pattern. And it thinks it's doing really well during training because it's only misclassified that one point. Uh, and during testing, right, we realize it's actually not doing so well. Uh, there's lots of points that it's misclassifying. But again, this is supposed to represent real world accuracy. OK? So, say we have our fitted machine learning model um, to classify URLs, and we hit it with some test data. OK? And we get back some really high, good test accuracy numbers. One response is to dance around and say, yeah, our model is so fit, but not so fast, right? Uh, because we live in the world of cybersecurity, uh, we care about deployment accuracy, which can be very different from test accuracy. Uh, and there's two main reasons for this. Okay, so first, deployment data from the perspective of your model is future data. If I train my model on all of the perfect data in the world up until today, and then I deploy it next week, because the threat landscape is always changing, right, um, next week it's going to be operating in a world that it's never seen before. And so the test accuracy from today is, gonna, is probably going to be a little bit better than the accuracy in next week, right? Because there's new malware out there, there's new malware out there. The second reason is that very, very often we don't even have access to deployment like data, 
right? So uh, for whatever reason, uh, maybe we can't get access to all of our customers' private emails because that would be a horrible thing, um, right? Maybe we don't have uh, all of our customers' URL browsing histories. Um, so often due to privacy, we, we're not sort of able to test how well our models are doing um, on the data that they're going to eventually have to perform on. And so this is sort of a concerning issue, right? Because when we don't have deployment data, we're concerned that this is going to happen. We're concerned that the data that we're using for training and testing in our laboratory uh, you know, looks one way, and then in deployment, uh, it looks another way. So we might have solid testing accuracy, and then on deployment, sad face, we do very terribly. So how do we stop this from happening, right? Uh, so this brings us to the analysis um, we're going to talk about, which is this train test sensitivity analysis. Uh, so the basic idea is to train and test the same model across different data sets and evaluate the results, right? So first, it's going to help us identify training sets um, that yield models that not only do well on sort of their own test sets, but on other data sets' test sets, OK? So um, find training data sets that yield models that generalize really well. Um, and second, it's going to help us sort of estimate how sensitive a model's accuracy is to changes in test data sets. So hopefully it's going to help us identify training data sets um, that will give us models that will perform sort of reliably and accurately on deployment. OK, so this is sort of a visualization of this analysis. Uh, say we have three, three training data sets, or three data sets. We build models A, B, and C, each trained on their own set. And then we test each map model out on the test set from all three data sets, right? So we get n squared uh, nine sets of accuracy metrics. OK, so let's actually uh, run through this analysis in real life with a real model, uh, real data, not in real time. Um, so first we're going to go through the model used, then the accuracy metric used, AUC, uh, our data sets, and finally we'll run through the results um, and our learnings. So first off, the model used. Uh, we used a convolutional neural net developed at Sophos to classify short strings. Uh, so very, very rapidly, this model takes in a raw character string. Um, it applies a learned embedding to each character, and so it transforms sort of one character into a multidimensional vector. Convolutional filters are applied to this. Uh, these are summed up and pushed through a couple of fully connected layers, and then this is aggregated into via a sigmoid uh, output neuron to give us sort of a final score, indicating uh, if our URL is benign or malicious, hopefully. Um, however, if none of that made sense, that is fine, right? Because we can just treat this as a black box. It's just a function. Um, so we have our input, our URLs, our function, and our output. So next up is the accuracy metric that we're going to be looking at, AUC. Uh, AUC stands for area under the rock curve. Uh, rock curve stands for receiver operating characteristics. Don't ask me why. Um, but these are a couple of examples of rock curves. So on the x-axis, you can see the false positive rate. And on the y-axis, you can see the true positive rate. So the cool thing about machine learning is that a given model is not going to act like a signature, right? It's going give it, to give us back a score, um, sort of like a probability, not a binary response. And so we can choose uh, a threshold to sort of tweak how sensitive we want our model to be. OK, so if we choose, for example, a really, really high threshold, we're going to get um, a lower false positive rate, um, but, a, but also a lower true positive rate. So if you look at these curves here, um, the dark, oh, I can't point, <laughs> the, I won't try, the dark red line going through the center of the plot uh, basically represents the predictive uh, capability of a coin flip, right? So very miserable. Um, the dark blue line at the very tippy top corner uh, has an AUC of about 0.999, and in the middle, that's an AUC of about 0.92. Okay, so AUC is just the area under one of these curves. So one is really good, 0.5 is terrible. Uh, finally, the data sets used. Okay, so we used three uh, sources of data, um, one from Common Crawl and Fish Tank combined, two from Sophos internal URL data, and three from VirusTotal. Uh, for each data source, we grabbed 10 million URLs from January 2017, and a couple more, million, a couple more million URLs 
uh, from January to around April 2017. Uh, but right, the, so, so the 10 million URLs were used for training, um, and the sort of January to April URLs were used for testing. And these are disjoint sets, right? So they're not overlapping, the URLs don't overlap. Uh, so the common crawl and fish tank data, uh, common crawl is a really cool foundation that sort of scrapes the web uh, and put it, puts it up on a public uh, AWS data set for people to use. Um, fish tank, fish tank basically stores and um, broadcasts a bunch of phishing websites, URLs that are, it's basically a big blacklist. Um, so in our case, we use fish tank URLs as uh, and common crawl URLs as benign. Uh, Sophos, um, we just used some internal uh, URL Sophos data. Uh, we removed whitelisted uh, URLs, and we also removed sort of label insure medium risk URLs. VirusTotal is a really cool website that uh, a lot of you may have heard of. It's basically an aggregator service. Um, so it uh, tells you what a bunch of different vendor companies thinks about a URL. So you can type in a URL, and it might come back and say, zero vendors thought this was malicious, nine thought this was malicious, 16 thought this was malicious. So for our, da our data, we took URLs that had zero flags and called them benign, uh, five or more flags called them malicious, and the rest we threw on out. OK, so let's visualize this again. Um, first, we trained a common crawl and fish tank model, then a Sophos model, and then a virus total model, all trained on January 2017 data. Uh, and then we tested each of these three models on our three test sources, right? So common crawl, Sophos, and virus total, yielding nine results. So let's look at those results. OK, so we're going to look at AUC. Um, and on the x-axis here, we have our training data sources, so our models. And on the y-axis, we have our test data sources. Uh, so looking at this data, uh, we'd probably choose a Sophos or common crawl model, OK? So if you look at how the Sophos trained model did, it did really, really well. It got us an AUC of 0.9993. Um, the common crawl model there on the left-hand corner uh, did a little bit worse, but still pretty solid. And the virus total trained model, the later blue square, um, did OK, but pretty badly. But what actually happens when we look at how each model did on the other test data sets? Ooh. They did really, really badly, or at least Common Crawl did. Um, so the Common Crawl trained model did, got an AUC of about 0.58 for our Sophos test data, uh, 0.7 for virus total. And that's pretty miserable, right? So if we deployed this model, but deployment data looks like virus total or Sophos, um, we wouldn't be in a good position. We'd be uh, missing a lot of threats. Uh, OK, Sophos. Sophos did a little bit better, but still pretty bad. Um, our Sophos trained model went down from 0.999 to about 0.8. So ugh. our virus total trained model, on the other hand, did quite well. So uh, both other test sets, our virus total model did um, cut about an AUC of 0.95 on the other two test sets, right? So it, it not only did well, but it did better on these other two test sets than it did on itself. That's actually due to a bit of an anomaly, but the key thing to note is that um, it did really well. It generalized well. So now, knowing this information, right, we might actually choose the virus total trained model to deploy if we're really unsure about deployment data. So this plot is showing the top row of the last plot over time. So the purple line up there at the top is our virus total model tested on virus total data over time. Uh, so as you can see, it was doing pretty, pretty well in January, solid, and then in February, it experiences big drop. Why was that? It was actually because uh, a very common domain in the virus total data set uh, flipped labels. Okay, so in January, most vendors are saying this is fine, URLs coming from this domain are fine, and in February, more and more started to say these are looking malicious. And so because our model was trained on data from January, when it was tested on data from February, it started to have bad results, right, because uh, the state of the world had changed. And so that's why it decayed so much. Usually this wouldn't happen with virus total data, um, but a very common domain flipped. So next up, let's look at how all three models did on Sophos test data. Uh, common crawl is mostly just depressing. <laughs> 
VirusTotal, though, as we've discussed, did really, really well. It started off at around 0.975 and then slowly decayed down to 0.95, so pretty solid for a 10 million uh, sort of training data set URL model. Um, <laughs> and Sophos did really, really well on its own test set. I'm going to zoom in on that blue line since it's pretty impossible to see what's going on. Uh, and that is that line zoomed in. So again, we're seeing some pretty strong time decay effects, right? Our model did really, really well in January, and then it does worse February onwards. Because although it's never seen these January URLs before, they're coming from a world uh, like they're coming from January. So they're more similar to the training data that our model uh, saw than uh, February or May testing data. OK, so what did we learn? Um, model accuracy is extremely dependent on the training and test data sets used, right? So if we had just, just even looking at these numbers, right, only looking at models that are trained on sort of their own data set and tested on another portion of their own data set, our AUC values still vary quite a lot from 0.9 to 0.999. Uh, and they vary way, way more if we're training on one data set and testing on another, right? So remember, the common crawl model uh, got an AUC of 0.58 on Sophos data, which is pretty terrible. OK, so second, we learned what data sets generalize better, right? So if we had only looked at this information um, before deploying our model, we probably would have deployed the Sophos model, the Sophos trained model, um, which had a really, really high AUC. But because we ran this analysis, we learned the virus total trained model is tending to generalize better to these other data sets. And so if we're unsure of uh, our deployment data, I would put my money on the virus total model. So finally, we learned more about the expected variance in accuracy on these new inherently um, different data sets. Right? So assuming we deploy this virus total model, and assuming we expect, uh, you know, fingers crossed, our deployment data to be in the range of these test sets that we've um, looked at, we can expect our AUC to also be in the range of the values that we, that we saw here, right? Um, I'd be surprised if we deployed it and it would be, and it's closer to sort of, you know, 0.58. Okay, so how to minimize the probability of failing spectacularly, because that's a really great thing to do. Um, models are really, really liable to fail on uh, new, inherently different data sets. And because we often don't know what deployment data is going to look like, uh, it's really, really important to map the limitations of our models and make sure that the models that we deploy uh, are going to be sort of reliable and consistent in their performance. So these kinds of analyses can help us to develop those models, models that work in the real world and not just in idealized laboratory settings and idealized paper settings. So TLDR, good day in, good model out. And that's it. Thanks. Okie doke. Do we have time for questions? Five minutes. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, you check what would happen if you were to train a fourth model that takes all sources. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I actually did. I should have included this that at the end of the slides. And it did. Can you the oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this man asked if we checked what would happen if we trained a model on all three sources of data. And we did check that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the ACE values with me, um, but it did quite, quite well. So it, it generally, um, so Sophos got like 0.999 on its own test data source. Um, and the model trained on all, all three sources did a little bit worse than that. But basically, it was a, it's a good idea to combine data, data sources. So if I had to choose, right, I'd probably uh, combine all three of these data sources, but focus on virus total data. Sorry. How did it do on the time decay? Um, oh, the combined model? Uh, so he asked how the combined model did on time decay. And I cannot remember, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. The question is the time decay uh, graphic is somewhat interesting. It drops suddenly, and then it stays pretty stable, right? So I would expect the degradation going like down with the time. Is that because of the uh, testing data set did not change significantly or 
Why, why is that? Basically? Yeah, so usually um, our models do decay much more gradually. So the, in the virus total example where we saw that really steep drop, that was because um, the labels in a very, very common domain flipped. And so we were all of a sudden um, getting a bunch of URLs wrong. But usually the decay is much, much more gradual. I have one. Uh, in the example of the uh, malicious URLs, how, how do you get the labels for your deployment data? For which URLs? Sorry? No, for your deployment data, how do you actually get labels, whether it's benign or malicious? For deployment data. Um, so, what deployment data? <laughs> like the ones you're gathering live, like how would you know if, if a new URL pops up whether it's actually malicious? The gathering from like our Sophos internal URL data or virus total or common crawl? Either of them. Either of them? Okay. Um, so common crawl and fish tank. Common crawl was just defined as benign because it's a, a scrape of the web. Uh, fish tank is phishing URLs, so defined as malicious. Um, Sophos, we just use our own URL labels um, that other teams have developed. And then uh, for virus total, we, we sort of define labels based on how many vendors have uh, told us this URL is bad. So um, zero, zero flags by vendors was defined as benign. Um, and then five or more flags from vendors was defined as malicious. And then the rest we threw out. Any others? Do you have comparative data on using other machine learning models besides neural networks? Is it, I mean, how do you know it's really not just a problem with how your neural network is optimizing the curve fitting? Um, I don't have precise data on how this works for like non-neural network models, um, but I, I, I think it would depend on sort of the complexity of the machine learning model used. Uh, did you try different uh, feature creation schemes, like different ways to tokenize the URL, and did you find one scheme worked particularly well for all three models, or did it vary by model? Uh, yeah, so interesting question. Um, so the model we used in this analysis was just fixed. We used the same um, composition, and Constantine Berlin and Josh, Sa Josh Sachs were the ones who actually developed this uh, model. and they found that they got the best accuracy by just learning these uh, sort of by, by taking a raw character string, giving it to the URL model, and then uh, the model sort of learns these embeddings for each character and then runs convolutions over them. So. Hi. Uh, is there a chance that uh, the de deployment data is uh, very different from, you know, all your three data sets so that uh, the actual result would be uh, you know, uh, not not good for uh, the deployment data. Even you apply your either of your um, models, three models. Yeah. So that's absolutely possible. If our deployment data is totally different than all of the data that we tested here, our model still could end up doing really bad on deployment, right? Um, so ideally, we want to get access to some deployment data so we can test out how our, how our model is doing. And when that's not possible at all, uh, this this analysis can hopefully help. Good question. Uh, based on the fact that um, the big drop that we observed on February was based on unknown facts because internet changes, um, if you feed the model on a daily or weekly basis, would that keep the accuracy flat? So if you're asking we retrain the model on a daily or weekly basis? Yeah. Um, yes. So ideally, we want to sort of be updating our model's weights um, and training it at sort of at a, at a very frequent um, like pace. Uh, but it's probably not going to be possible, right, to to uh, upload new weight sets to our clients' computers every single day because they're you know at least a couple of megabytes. So uh, it can be slow. People will get upset. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Cool. Hi. Uh, quick question. Um, I'm curious. What, have you tried using Ensemble to see if the combination of three separate models trained on three distinct or to some extent different, very different or independent data sets? Okay. So using like an ensemble of models each trained on different training data sets? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, I personally am not, but yeah, that's a great idea. Um, you could either do that or sort of combine multiple training data sets to uh, sort of make a mega model. Um, but hopefully sort of analyses like these will help us learn which training data sets to focus most on. Cool. And I'm curious, were you able to, were you guys able to figure out why the common crowd data set was so different from the other ones? Um, I, I haven't done enough analysis on it. I, my, my guess is, so there's, there's two reasons. My guess is that uh, Fish Tank was sort of a biased bad data set, um, mm -hmm. but free to use. Uh, because it, it's only showing phishing websites, right? So that's bad. And we also had a limited number of uh, sort of malicious phishing URLs from that yeah. website just because they didn't have a ton. Um, so that model was, I think, a little bit worse, worse off. I see. Oh, sorry, one last question. I'm curious, have you guys also tried perturbing the non malicious, let's say, host names or URLs by okay. randomly flipping a byte or a character? Uh, so assuming that it will still be malicious. So like perturbing the URL and then seeing if uh, our model still thinks it's bad? Or, yep. um, yeah, I bet. I, I think uh, Josh Sachs, oh. my manager, has a lot of information on that. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, question. On the virus total data set, uh, did you, when uh, deciding if a URL was good or not, did you take into account when the last scan was or the first scan was in relation to the URL? Or did you take like the most recent ones? Or Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we actually sort of take virus total. So virus total itself um, only stores last scans. But we store those scans so we can have um, like a history of how uh, classifications changed over time so that we can do analyses like these, time decay analyses. Uh, so we're looking at the last, the sort of last scan taken on a given date, right? So a January URL was scanned on that date, and that was the result that was, um, give, that was sort of spit back by virus shuttle on that date, even if it was scanned later on. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering, is, uh, were the virus total results based on the contents, like the website, or purely the URL string? Um, on the contents? I'm not sure I understand. Like, um, like, did they go to the website and see if it was malicious, or did they, it was it just like the URL itself? Oh, okay. Um, so do the virus total vendors have access to content other than just the URL string? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Do they? <laughs> I think, OK, they do. My team's telling me they do. <laughs> Unlike us, we just got the URL string. <laughs> OK, cool. I guess I'll talk to you more after. Thanks. <laughs> OK, uh, it looks like we're out of time, um, so I think I'm going to jump down here. But thanks.